Jack Seeley. Hi. Welcome to the Process Podcast. <laughs> Thanks for having me. How you doing? Yeah, good. Why are you good? Because I'm finally here. It's been... How long has it been going? Oh, as an avid Process Podcast listener, yeah. we just talked about, you should know this, this answer, surely. Two and a half years. Well, actually, that's a great question. I don't know how long it's been going for time, but we are episode 180... Seven. It's taken 187 100, before me to get here. Yeah. Fucking hell. But you know what they say. Save the best till halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we're not, not, this is definitely not the last, but save the best till later <laughs> yes. is, a, is a very common popular expression. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you for being here though. No, thanks for having me. Um, Jack, can I ask you to give your rendition on how we know each other? Uh, so I would say we are childhood friends. Uh, grew up in Hong Kong. Both went to international schools, both sporty, and kind of just met that way. I think the first time we met was when I gate crashed one of our friends, well, now friends, it wasn't my friend at the time, his birthday party. <laughs> and I think I met all of you, because we were in a different school, right? So I was friends with Andy Russell, who we might or might not see on a different podcast later on. Uh, but he was going to a birthday party and invited me along. And I don't think it was his place to do that. <laughs> it definitely wasn't. Was there not a part of you that said, okay, whilst it might not be his place to do this, was there not a part of you that said, I probably shouldn't do this? I think that's where I might have invented YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> because I just thought, why not? <laughs> I feel like that's, I feel like you've really consistently uh, carried that motto with you. I've just thought, why not? I think it just sounded like a cool thing. <laughs> what we doing? Bowling, bowling, right? Temping bowling, yeah. Mm. Shout out Chris Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Fultz. Um, I actually think I my first memory of you goes uh, is is before that. I think it was playing Kellett School versus Bradbury oh, School yeah, maybe. in like primary four or something. Yeah. Um, and you were probably the worst player in their team. That's why you always just stood out. Yeah. So yeah, that's probably why I don't actually remember you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember the best players? No, because obviously I have just would have like dribbled past or something and gone like... <laughs> <laughs> well so i think to summarize the story if jack we go way back yeah. um to being in primary school yeah um and then we were going away to university yeah seeing each other in the uk yeah. whilst we're at university and then coming back here um you have been um doing many different things but the main thing that has occupied a lot of your life has been professional football yep we're going to say that for another podcast okay. uh, where we're going to get yourself and andy we're going to talk about you know that being 36 years old and still playing professional football. Um, but most recently you've opened a barbershop. Yep. Tell uh, us about that. Uh, so it's about two, it'll be three years in December. Uh, so we opened just before COVID happened. Uh, and we have hopefully seen the worst of what Hong Kong had to offer. And we've just come out of it and th thriving on the, on the upward trajectory. But we're doing well and it's been uh, exciting. It's definitely something new every day, to be honest. I, rem I remember when I think we were on a little hike. I think we were doing, um, what's the part of you hike? Um, there's Twins. Yeah. We were doing a twins, I think, one day. Maybe it was the start of the pandemic. Mm. And you were talking about the idea of opening up a barbershop. Yeah. And I remember asking you a lot of questions uh, around like why, how, when is this going to happen? Do you remember when and why you decided to open up a barbershop? Um, I think I've always wanted to do something for myself and I've always enjoyed um, ha well, the idea of having a shop. What kind of shop that would be would be some varied because I'm, I'm, I like trainers, shoes, uh, clothes, um, tattoos. I used to go to the barbershop quite a lot. So then it just made me think it would be cool to have something of my own. That was before. And then obviously as I've got older and was playing football and then COVID hit and stuff, I was kind of like, I want to do something for myself. Uh, what can I do? Obviously then just put the ideas together and having been around the world to different barbershops and seen different things, I like the idea of tying a lot of different little genres to the, to the main one. And then just coming up with like a, not a different idea because I think people have done similar stuff, but I think, yeah, just to, just to have something for myself and something that I enjoyed and was like quite passionate about. You know, the whole idea of having something for yourself, yeah. which I feel like a lot of business owners or people who find businesses, found businesses say, 
what is it about wanting something to be yourself that drove you to want to do it? Uh, so I've been playing football, obviously, for the last like 15 years. So for me, it was one, I didn't know what I would do afterwards. And when I started to rack my brains, I was like, what would I actually do? I did. I went to university, I've got a degree. But a lot of people obviously start when they finish uni working. So then you're at the bottom at a young age and you're working your way up. So by the time you get to 35, 36, 37, 40, whatever, you're in a place where you are happy with. But obviously I've been playing football until I'm still 36. So then I didn't want to have to go to the bottom level. I wanted to kind of be maybe in the middle or near the top. And that's what, that's, so that's what I was thinking. Is like, well, can I set something up so that I don't have to worry about my credentials or what I've done before? I can be safe financially and also for the future doing something that I want to do and it also gives me an opportunity to open one here maybe elsewhere around the world and give me a chance to break away from Hong Kong and do other things so I think that was partly what I wanted to do and I think I've I've always said that my goal isn't to be the richest man alive it's just to be completely comfortable where I'm in control of my day-to-day and being able to be financially stable. So, so can I ask that again? I'm just going to dig into that. What you said there about you played football, so basically you hadn't acquired the work experience. Yeah. Essentially, if you'd have not started something yourself, you'd have to like start at the bottom. I feel, uh, yeah, I feel, I f- yeah, definitely. I know. And what, what about that? Did you not want to do? Was it the fact that you would be a small fry again? Was it the fact that you'd have to learn a lot? Was it the fact that financially you'd be starting probably somewhere low, and it'd be a long time before you're earning what you want? It would have it would have been mainly finances mm. because I was happy to go into an industry and start from the beginning mm. because I've got no, I've, I, w- I would have no qualms with that. I've got no, I would have no ego starting something new. How can you expect to start halfway through or at the top of something that you've not started? You have to start at the bottom. It would be purely financially. So I wouldn't want to go into a low, uh, uh, <clears throat> like a, a startup thing where you weren't making as much as I would have. Cause over the years I've obviously made a certain amount accustomed to certain things having certain rents blah 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 blah. Mm. so then you can't go back and be like well this is the wage at this it'd be hard by the time you your wage goes up that's 20 years down the line or 10 years down the line you know what's interesting is that i think a lot of people and i definitely had this thought as well when i started my own business was that owning your own business is a is a quick quicker route to financial freedom no (laughs) but it's not but it means it's interesting you're saying no way but then it also hearing what you were saying about finishing football or you know starting at 35 and owning a business because it could give, give you financial freedom what been has that been different to what you'd so what I th- you've experienced versus what you thought so then so then i think it comes to um starting in a say if you were just starting i don't know going into a restaurant let's mm. say you go in as a as a waiter how, how long is it until you become the manager of that how long did then your regional manager you don't know and you're working for someone else always whereas if you have your own business you can you're working towards your own thing and you it's just you're, you're enjoying what you're doing at the same time while building up of course i'm not at a financial stage where i'm like yes i can just sit back and retire but you're in control of that destiny mm. it's i guess it's similar to buying a house right if you're renting a house you're giving your money away but if you buy your own house you're almost like well i'll pay this because in the, in the future you'll you're paid off and you don't have to, you, 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 you're set yeah. uh, in, a, in a way. But yeah, I think it's more that the fact that you're in your own thing, happy to be doing what you want to do. You'll, you'll give sacrifices and you'll, you'll do more for it because it is your baby. So you want it to grow and you see the potential in it. Yeah. So you're more, you're happier to start at the bottom and then with, with the potential to, to build up to the top. Yeah. And I think the work, the work feels meaningful. <clears throat> Right. Yeah, so exactly. It's like, you know, say, knowing yeah. knowing yeah, what yeah. you're doing is contributing to something that you're yeah. aspiring to exactly. create and build yeah. and achieve is yeah. it can make the the process of all the hard work, Absolutely. which might be you might have hard work in another job, yeah. but feel a bit more meaningful. Well, I think yeah. I mean, you you'd be silly to go in and think yeah I'm going to be rich in a year. Mm. It, it's definitely a long term project, but I think it's just purely the 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 goal at the end is a lot more is appealing. I yeah. think okay so let's backtrack again yeah to start to 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 deciding that the barbershop is where you want to go to so really basically what you said is that 
the way that you describe yourself, you're basically saying that you're really edgy. Is that what you would say? Yeah. Would you call yourself edgy? Yeah. No. I think you're quite edgy. I wouldn't. I think there's different edges to people. Yeah, what and edge I have are you? A quite conservative edge. You reckon? Yeah. What am I if you're a conservative edge? You're just conservative or boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew boring was going to come out. <laughs> yeah, I think... Just boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes boring and dad. So would, you, would, would, would you say that because I get my hair cut at source that's made me a little bit less boring? Or have I brought down the average no, no, source? No, no. I think it make it, it gives you a, a slight edge. Because I feel quite <laughs> I feel quite cool. You're cool when you go in. When I come into source I feel I yeah, feel quite cool. Yeah. No, I mean what one thing we, we don't uh expect any we we're open to everyone. So that you you, you we wouldn't expect certain, just a certain characteristic of a person to come in. Absolutely no way. We have all walks of life come in from businessmen to granddads to edgy people to... People like me. To fitness people. Yeah. Um, so, 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 okay. So how did you land on the barber shop? Because I think really important context for people here is that you're not a barber. No, I'm not a barber. You weren't cutting hair. No. That wasn't... I mean, there was a point in time where you were saying that you were thinking maybe about like doing yeah. a course and learning how to cut hair. Yeah, I still would like to. Yeah. So how do you, how do you land on this idea of opening a barbershop? Like you've never worked in a barbershop before. Nope. You've never cut hair. Um, and then, you know, you suddenly just jump in and, and you're now, you know, you're running, you know, one of Hong Kong's yeah. coolest barbershops. Um, so I guess, like I was saying before, I used to get my hair cut quite a lot. And it's in Hong Kong, the barber scene was completely different to the UK, for example, where you could go around any corner and there'd be a barber that could do the specific cut of haircut or the fading and blah, blah, blah. Whereas in Hong Kong, I found that there was hairdressers or salons, but their fading techniques were completely different. So as soon as I found a barbers in Hong Kong, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm going to stick with you guys because I'm quite into my hair, obviously. And I get it. I used to go twice, uh, once every two weeks, just because that's just what, what I like to do. Um, then I met Sean, who's my business partner. And then just from sitting in the chair with him and having discussions about everything, tattoos, fashion, art, music, blah, blah, blah. We would just have the same conversation over and over again saying, oh, imagine if we had this, imagine if we did this. And I think it kind of just snowballed a little bit going like, why, why actually can't we do that here? There is a gap in the market for something that we would like to do. And I think... I met Sean, he was the, the barber and I thought, right, he, if, if he's going to be the main barber guy and my business partner, we can set up something great and, and why not? And I think we, we, we complement each other. Well, obviously he's got the skills of that, but then I, I do all the business side of things. Um, and then we've kind of just grown slowly over the, over the years. And like I said, it's been almost three years now, but we started with him acquired one more which is chris and then have been just picking up now and then we've got six basically full-time barbers now plus me so seven of us working to one goal what was the process that you went through i remember a lot of it but what was the process that you went through when you said okay we're gonna i want to start committing to this idea of opening up a bar barber shop mm. uh i guess i'll share when I first started Coastal, yeah. there really wasn't any thought that went into it. Yeah. I was just like, right, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to create a website first. Yeah. I'm going to put it out there and I'm just going to figure, I'm going to figure things yeah, out yeah, as, I, as I along. go along. But I remember talking with you. I think you'd asked me some questions around leases and mm. accounting. And yeah, yeah. I kind of just shared my two cents on if I was to do it again, yeah. here's how I would do it. Yeah. Um, but I guess the question is, yeah, which of those two ends of the spectrum did you take? Did you kind of just go with the flow and figure things out as you went along, or were you a meticulous planner? Did you did you plan everything out ahead of time? Business plans, budgeting, forecast. Did you raise money? What so it, like? um, it was a, a bit of planning, but no way meticulous planning. So there. So previously, what about eight nine years ago? Now I started my own clothing line, Hot Monday. R.I.P. That was that was. Can I just say? I thought that was a really cool. A really cool concept. Why did that finish? Remind me. So I moved to China. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and right. everything. To play footy. Yeah. And the website and all the emails. The back end, all the back end was Google. Hmm. And Google's banned in China. So it was difficult. And then obviously I 
was a one man band. So then all the stock was just like in a storeroom. So like if I had an order, normally I would go and finish it all off and pack everything and send it. So have not having that. So then having to rely on a f- friends, actually Max Woodward used to do that for me sometimes. So it was just a bit on the podcast. Yeah. So that was just a bit difficult to carry on with. And then like I, was, like I used to do all the designs, everything. And it just kind of fizzled and it needed a lot more tender love and care than I actually would give it. And I, I was doing it just as a side project, just to keep me entertained. But then when you look at all the competition on Instagram and things like that, it's not side projects. They are fully backed with funds and Instagram models and teams and teams and photographers and video. And that was the thing that it was fine. I could set up a certain level, but until I actually invested full on into it, then it was never going to go anywhere. So I'm just, just to pause you on that train of thought. That's exactly what I experienced with earned. Yeah. Um, you know, was, yeah, was you have th- to dive in. You, you're just thinking that it's going to be yeah, easy. easy. Yeah, and yeah, you, you, you make your first, yeah. you, you know, you create your first product and it flies off the yeah, shelves yeah. and you think, yeah, this is going to be easy. Yeah. And then, all and that. then, you know, I think naturally with anything that grows and also linked to how much you want it to grow. Mm. And I think not, no one really goes into business, not wanting to achieve more yeah. all the time. And you realize to achieve more, you need to give more. Yeah, of course. Um, and that's that was a, a harsh, a yeah. harsh learning uh, lesson that I experienced. With yeah. That. So then that so from so from having that, it was just things like I never did the proper accounts. I never forecasted how much I was going to do, how much or the projections of how much I needed to sell for this. Blah 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 blah. So that was one thing. I was like, right, whatever I do now, I'm going to completely write everything down and plan everything. And I'm quite an OCD kind of person anywhere where I like to be organized. Um, but I'm also not, the, I'm, I'm business savvy, but I'm not an experienced 40 years in the industry savvy where profit and loss accounts are, is what I do for, for breakfast. You know what I mean? So like I'm, I can do it, but it's not my forte. Yeah. So I created a business plan uh we went through what we wanted to do myself and sean uh came up with numbers projected a few things of how it could work uh and yeah we basically had some finances that we were like okay this can work and then the annoying thing was obviously because it was covid we didn't know how long it was going to go but because the protests were happening before the prices of rent had massively dropped in the area that we wanted to do it in and based on our concept we had a specific area in mind and knew that if it was going to work, it had to be in basically like a 300 meter radius around. So, which is basically right <clears> in the middle of town, Hold basically. On. Yeah. So there's bars, restaurants, and a lot of foot, foot traffic. So there was a place that opened up and I was kind of like, right, it's now or never we've got this, we've been given a really good price on rent. That's basically almost another leg up to be like, if you can't make it work now, when can you make it work? And I think everything just kind of was in my head in our favor and i was like there's no way this can fail and obviously COVID comes thankfully we only had to close for a month unlike you guys which is almost about eight years <laughs> feels like it but thankfully because we had sean who'd been working in hong kong he had a client list already we had chris who'd been working in hong kong had a client list and people were locked in hong kong barbershops were still running like normal so the clients that were coming in were we didn't really have to, we had we we obviously got new clients but we already had a base of clients that were there that was kind of ticking things over so we survived um but yeah in hindsight it could have been awful yeah like really bad yeah it's amazing how there's always when you trace back it's so many success stories yeah. there's always a bit of luck that falls yeah i mean with no way favor. i'm not it's no way near success yet we had three like i say we're three years in but we've survived the bad point and uh we're coming out and we've kind of we're in a good position now we've got definitely room to grow uh, which we are now but yeah in hindsight it could have been pretty woeful because yeah. it could have just been we could, we could have had no clients yeah with rent to pay for a certain amount of years and and staff to pay i mean i think what i want a lot of this podcast to be about is about owning a business yeah and you know what goes into creating a business and then what actually goes into you know maintaining and growing a business mm. um would you say when you started this, there was a lot of risk for you? Would you say this was high risk? Was it low risk? I think starting any business is high risk because mm. you have to, there's money in, you're, you're going to put some money into invest in things and you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. That that could all be washed away in in months. 
and that's the reality of it so i think everything's a, is a risk you can never predict if it's going to work or not um so yeah I, I yeah it was definitely risky and that's what i mean like in at the beginning i was all gung-ho and going like yeah amazing this is never going to fail how can it fail had no risk in me at all and now i'm like okay wow well, that could have really backfired but also still open to pushing and being a bit risky and opening other things mm. because i can see the potential for things so you, you just have to think of it a bit more strategically and logically sometimes what are some of, well, okay two questions first question i'm gonna start with this question is what is your role like what do you do day to day with the barbershop because you're still not cutting hair yep so what I what is your role? So I my title would be like operations manager. So there's days like today, no, like yesterday for example. We so we open from Monday to Saturday. Uh, some of our days off for Monday, uh, Sunday, Monday, and then a few people work Tuesday to Saturday. So I, I do Mondays to Saturday at the moment. So like yesterday for example, I was in the shop just helping out, basically acting as receptionist, cleaning up. Doing, putting doing serving laundry, me water serving you water Just making coffees get me a cold towel exactly just basically anything that needs to be done in the shop uh helping out there because sometimes it can be busy and when all of our barbers have got clients it's just easy it makes it easier for everyone if somebody's checking somebody out someone's getting the, the cash blah, blah 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 all the all that kind of stuff but then also at the same time i'm 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 speaking to other like planning events and speaking to other brands or um uh venues about what, what what we can do for the future and how we can collaborate um doing a lot i do a lot of the accounts like daily accounts so just obviously going through the day before the week before putting it all into spreadsheets and sending things off to the can i pause you on that yeah because i know you said at the start and if i think about jack seeley i'm not going to think numbers man no i'm going to think numbers is probably going to be quite low low down on your skill set thank goodness for calculators <laughs> so I mean, you said it's not something you're interested in, but now it's something that's a part of your job. It's a it, that's the, I would say the accounting side is one of the is is the main thing that I is the thing that takes a lot of my time. Has that become something now that you're developing a skill set in it that's become of interest to you? Uh, I wouldn't say it's of interest. I think it's necessity. It's a hundred percent necessity because mm. if you neglect that, then you don't know what's going on. So yeah. you have to just make sure that everything's obviously ticking over. Just keep an eye on the, the budgets and things like that. Because obviously, if you're not, you could check six months later and suddenly you're like, how have we spent $500,000 on water yeah. or something like that? And you're like, well, I should have checked that daily because mm. you can see that. So it's just the things like that way. And then just keeping on track to make sure that boring things like making sure the till catch is in line and with your, the accounts and stuff, the bank accounts and all that kind of stuff. Would you, would you say that these are jobs that you resent? No, no. That's just, these are the ones you just have to do, and I, 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 I don't mind it actually. I enjoy it. I feel like I'm getting. It does make me feel like I'm doing something business like. Yeah, but I think it's an important question, right? Because I think there's a lot of people in business, uh, and I've been guilty of this at some points of my career, and, and the message that I've tried to put out to my team, which is you need to do things that you love doing. Mm. Um, and I think that's what people, a lot of people aspire to have when they own a yeah, business is that it's my business. I'm just going to do this, yeah, the yeah. stuff that I'm really good at yeah. and that I love doing. Yeah. But I think the realism of it is that, especially in the early days of a small business, much of the time, much of our time is spent doing things that actually wouldn't, we don't enjoy doing. Yeah. And I, the way that I've seen it as my role has evolved over 15 years with this company is that as the company grows, I have slowly yeah, yeah, relinquished yeah. the jobs that I know I'm not good yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. And I know that I don't enjoy doing till I'm at a point now where the vast, vast majority of things I do are things that I really love doing. Yeah. And I think I'm really good at. Mm. And accounting has been one of those things that has, I have always struggled with and I still struggle with it. Right. Um, but only probably in, since the pandemic yeah, which yeah, yeah. really like highlighted our financial position yeah. and it made me really like yeah, you... go through it with a fine comb and a magnifying glass to be like what's going on yeah, yeah. how long can we survive yeah, basically yeah. like how many months of life yeah. have we got left yeah, yeah. that was really the time that kick-started an actual deeper interest in understanding the numbers but do you actually like it now or you just know you have to do it i think a part of me because i understand it more now yeah. and i've just had more experience it i think a big part of like so many things you don't like it when you don't know how no, to course, do it or yeah. you're not good at it yeah right and it was because i had told myself that i wasn't good at it i hadn't invested the time 
or energy to actually learn about mm. it. So every time the conversation of accounting came up, yeah, I would just kind of black out. Yeah, I would just, just shy away. And just yeah, I just bothered. not be involved in it, or I just pretend to know what I was talking about because mm. it's kind of one of those. I feel like I've always felt in business is that the people that know the numbers always seem like the most busy sab business savvy people. And I maybe have some imposter syndrome in that sense where it's like, I feel like I need, mm. I should give the perception or the image that I understand numbers, but truth be told, it's like the least, it's probably the least of my yeah. concerns, but it's probably the most important yeah, thing. Well, that's it, right? So I think, I think now I'm in a position where I actually have a deeper interest in it, but it's only because I've put more time and energy into learning about yeah. it more. Mm. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that's a big part of what I love about business. We're going through contract <laughs> negotiations for a new lease right now. And this has been like, you know, this is probably my fifth iteration of having to sit down with the landlord and negotiate a new lease. And I've never enjoyed it. Mm. But this time around, yeah, I yeah. really put a bit more time into learning, you know, speaking with some, some of our members who work in property who like, you know, gave me some great advice on how to like approach a negotiation, yeah. you know, made me understand the market. You know, it's, you know, all of those things made me feel a lot more confident going into meetings this time. Yeah. And I feel like I leveled up. I was like, okay, I've now acquired another skill set that I have in my mm. arsenal as a business owner that I can now, you know, apply to the future. Mm. So I think again, another example that, you know, you get out of it, what you put into it. And if you're not going to put anything into it, then you're probably not going to enjoy it. You're not going to yeah. be very good at it. Yeah. But no, I mean, I'm, yeah, completely. But I think, yeah, going back to that, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm no, no whiz with accounting, but I just kind of have to understand bits of it. You, it you, you were just talking about um like a lot of your time is spent speaking to other businesses creating events doing things outside of cutting hair yeah that's one of the things that i've been most impressed with i always tell you about it as well whenever i see you doing events um i'm always like i think it's really cool that you're doing this and i think it's really powerful that you're doing it because you're getting your brand out there like you're doing things that no one else is doing mm. and it was always something that i have learned from watching you do that as a, also a business owner is at first when you said you were going to be doing things like um like basically like having like an open night where you basically yeah. put on a few drinks and get i was i was like how is that going to help you be a better barbershop like why are you diving into like the bar scene now or like the art scene or like selling sneakers in your barbershop i couldn't work out because i'm like surely you just want to mm. be the best at cutting hair yeah. Um, but what I think I have seen, um, and I would love to hear from you if this has been the intention, is with all these events that you do, collaborations, pop-ups, you know, going around and working restaurants in Hong Kong and doing these cool little, I'm just going to call them edgy events because <laughs> what edgy people do and you, you are a bit edgy. But what I've seen is that you cultivated a community in a barbershop. So what happens at the same people who get the haircut and source are the same people that go to these events mm. and they get to know each other. They build friendships and that is a big part of what people is keeping people coming back to source that's why i keep on coming mm. back to source is because obviously you're my mate and i'm going to support your brand but it's also that i've gotten to know all the other barbers in there the other customers who are often there at the same time yeah. as me and i have conversation with them so now it's <clears> become <throat> almost less about the haircut yeah. and it's become more about feeling like i'm a part of something yeah. and i always thought that was really cool because that's essentially my whole business is not intentionally but it's basically been built, built yeah, around community, community yeah. right and like this feeling that you have this common interest with the people around you uh you've got friendships that people you want to spend time with inside and outside of yeah. whatever the workplace is and i never thought you could create that in a barbershop because in a barbershop you come in you sit down for 30 minutes you're just with your barber and then you're out of there like there aren't really like, you're not doing group workouts. So you're not doing like group haircuts. So you're not doing like group discussions, you know? And I think I've seen it now. I'm like, wow, you know, you can actually, you can create community in almost anywhere. Mm. Is that, was that something you set out to do from the start? And is that the motivator behind doing all these things outside of just cutting hair? Yeah. So we wanted it to be, we, we never said let's build a community, but we wanted it to be a cool place for people to come and just not, if, I mean, you just hang out. But if you look at traditional barbershops in, in a lot of places, it's a place where people to, would go to, to hang out. 
yeah. you see them where they turn the chairs around and everyone's facing the same way and they're having a conversation. We wanted that to come back because in Hong Kong, there was a lot of what you've just said, where you go in as one on one, you have your, your cut and you go home. And it's freelancers a lot of the time, right? Uh, so, I mean, sometimes, yes. But I think the places I've been to was always, yeah, maybe some places, but then it, I basically it, just went to places you went to because I thought you were way cooler than me. No, so you like, tried to get me to go to your guy and I was like, no, I'm not going to. Who there found Ray Lowe? I don't know you. Wasn't I think it? I found Ray Lowe. I think you found him, and you were like, "Let's." Uh, <laughs> and you we? copied me. I went once. And I was like, "I'm never going back." Yeah. You stuck with Ray for ages. Did you know? He started trying to do my beard, and I was like, "Oh my god, he's going to shave it off." Uh, I mean, us Asians, we don't have beards, so we're not not great beard trimmers. I feel like that's. But so know. that I think that was what the. Not that we're saying we we're reinventing how to be barbers or bar have a barber shop, but it was like that was what we noticed that was not happening it was like it wasn't an open space for people to come and I, I think barbers are one place where people guys come especially to come and talk so it's like why not just open it for everyone and make it a comfortable place and we wanted it we've got a big seating area in our place and we did that intentionally just so that there is a place to sit because some places you you come in while you're waiting for your haircut there's two little stools and it's not an inviting place but we've kind of got a an area to sit we've got drinks coffees beers and we kind of have wanted it to be an open space where people can come and work if they want to or just come and wait for their friend and have a drink. So that was one thing that we did want to do is just make it more welcoming. Um, and the way it's worked is, I mean, we, we weren't actively thinking how do we get into people's brains to make them think this. It's just kind of happened. And I think it's been quite organic. And I think, I don't know, maybe it is, it's just how how we are. We're just open, like Sean, especially, he's, he's such a pe people person. He could speak to anyone. So I think his his personality, it, you, he, he, you, you feel right at home when you, when you start speaking to him. And I think that is that just transcends through the shop. And I can speak to people as well. I'm very personable. And I think we've just made it so that you feel welcome and you're almost in someone's like living room in a way. You just, we just want you to be comfortable. And the idea of was 100% to constantly do events. So one, as a marketing strategy. And two, it's like, why not just collaborate with other brands from Hong Kong who are also doing cool stuff? Um, so we wanted to be like, if we know an artist that's up and coming or young as well, we're, we're in exactly the same position. We're up and coming. We were like, we're like well, why not just do something together and let's host a, host a party at our place. Let's... To have, like speak to our drink sponsor and ask for a few cans of beer and just say yeah everyone come down and have some drinks what, what's the harm in doing that it's like why not like this and then from there it's just a bit of a word of mouth thing and people see that you're doing fun things and you do something else and do something else and it just pulls in a lot of different people from different genres basically and that's what i was saying where it's a barber shop one is the haircuts but there's so many little umbrella arms that go off it such as fashion music art comedy it's just like it's endless it's like why not so we are we did aim to collaborate with a lot of different people purely just to branch out and just constantly be busy and doing cool things what do you reckon is the coolest event you've done apart from the one you did at coastal yeah that was probably the best one yeah no. um we've done some pretty cool things uh we did one we did one for november down at the aia wheel right under, uh, at the front so that was pretty cool being in front of the uh very iconic yeah very iconic uh we did one in hsbc head office again very iconic that was pretty crazy um you've done a lot of stuff with around men's health yeah we've done we've done a bit of that because like i said guys come into barbershops and feel at ease so they just talk and it's mm. we don't we're not trying to be men's health advocates but it's just like we we were just trying to obviously help with men's health and just be like well you can come here and talk if you need to talk and it's also the other way where people think it's just the clients that talk it's like sometimes the barbers need a bit of relief you don't know what they're going through and it there's things that it's just a back it's basically a conversation that no one's judging each other yeah. and somehow over the years a, any barber shop has kind of become a safe space and i think the relationship with your barber becomes more than just friendship it actually becomes someone that you trust and that's why you end up going and that's what you said you like you're saying you you constantly come back now not because of the haircuts it's more because of the vibe and the friendships you made and i think that's almost half of it yes you can give a really good haircut but if you can build a relationship with your client, you could give them a really bad haircut, but they'd still come back because they're your friend now. And you could, you can, you, you just feel like they're your, 
you're more than friends in a way. And you, you hear a lot of people, the relationship that they, they have with their barber, they almost feel like they're cheating when the barber's away or they, they're they full. Or, I feel that. Yeah, so people, I mean, we've had guys who've been away for six weeks and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to have a haircut for six weeks, don't worry. And they're like, no, no, you can go to one of the other guys, it's fine, like, just come back, it's fine. But they're like, no, 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 I could never do that to you. I mean, I always feel that when I, if I can't get the barber that, I norm, that normally cuts my hair, mm. you'll just very nonchalantly be like, oh, but so-and-so's open. I'll be like, <laughs> Yeah, but I can't. But I can't do that because I know what you mean. But you know, so I, I totally understand. But at the end of the day, for you and your team, if this because this was just a misconception that I had created, yeah. thinking that the barber would be upset with me yeah. for going to another barber. Actually, I have felt the vibe that as long as your team, when your team sees me with anyone in your team, yeah, they're happy. And I think that's what we would prefer. It's like you're coming to source. Obviously, you have your preferences. But if, as a one-off, that person is busy, there's absolutely no reason not to go to see someone else because they're all at the same skill set. Yeah. It's not as if you're going in there and going like, oh, I don't want that one. Mm. We, we, we would like to think that everyone's at a certain level and can do a certain haircut so that you know that as a brand, you go to source, your, your minimum is going to be really good. That is such a hard thing to do in a people industry, in, yeah. in a people serviced industry yeah which is both of us yeah right and that has been something that i have been constantly has been at the forefront of what we're trying to do yeah especially when it's something like group coaching right where traditionally and and to be honest it will always exist right people are always going to have their favorite the person yeah, they have course. which is often like you said sometimes based on the skill set but also sometimes based on the relationship that that coach has built with them yeah um but ultimately not having disparities in quality amongst your teams like it's not it's not good to be a gym to have a rock star coach mm. whoever wants to attend their class and then every other coach no one wants mm. to attend right because the moment the rock star coach isn't there your business suffers and the egotistical younger me actually used to take a lot of pride in the sense that i felt like i was the best coach and i wanted to be the best coach and then i realized i was actually crippling my business mm by putting so much precedence on me and not putting enough time into developing my other coaches. Uh, and so the moment we started doing that, it's like, you know, we've set the standard now, you know, we can, we can take these senior coaches and have them set the gold standard, but we all got, we've all got to get there because mm. the end of the day, you know, a client is paying for the service they deliver, that they receive from the gym, not from Ed Haynes, the coach. And it means that no matter when they come in, you know, they've got to receive that same level of standard or same level of service at all times. Yeah. So it's cool that you've, that you've also, you know, yeah, I mean, that's what we want. That's, that's, yeah. But that's what we want. That's what we want to do is that we want every, we, I mean, we had a meeting the other day just saying everyone's equal. There's no higher and lower. I mean, obviously there's a couple, there's, there's a guy that's just come in and he's at, at junior level cause he's not been cutting for, for long, but there is stages to it. But eventually once you're a barber, everyone's a barber. There's mm -hmm. no, there's nothing yeah you you can expect the same service across the board basically but well, anyway. i'm really happy you talked about relationships and that how how that is such a backbone of your business you know developing relationships with people and like you said when you develop amazing relationships people will come back mm. regardless of the service yeah. what do you think are the most important things that go into building a relationship i guess just being well one personable what does that mean to just, you just so imagine if you go into, I mean, I can imagine if I went into a barbershop and I sat down and the guy was like, all right, yeah, what do you want? Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, all right, sweet. Well, I'm going to be sat here for 45 minutes. At least be nice. Yeah. So straight away, you're like, well, this guy's a prick. Yeah. So you've just got to be open and you can read cues as well. There's obviously some people that go in and love a chat. So you've got to be chatty back and you've almost got to leave your... I say leave your I think it's the same in any industry or any job leave what's happening at home behind and mm -hmm. just be sometimes maybe you have to put on a show if you've got to be nice I think but it's just being open personable honest and just just being a soundboard to some people I think so if people are asking you questions you reply and vice versa but if you're asking questions to someone and just going oh how's your day yeah you've been busy and they're just giving you one word answers you read the cue that they don't want to speak and you just so that's absolutely fine no problem at all they want to come in and maybe they've had a busy day made busy five hours of work in meetings and they just want an hour of silence before they go back to work and that's 
that's absolutely fine so i think it's just being adaptable to what people want and and how to communicate with people yeah nice i agree with all that i think also just showing people that you care yeah is so important yeah and i think you can also go i mean what we, we i mean you say go the extra mile but it's like we come in and we offer drinks and cold towels hot towels and basically just make people feel comfortable and yeah. looked after um and if they need something even small things like charging your phone it's like oh yeah no worries we've got one here do you want it next to you or do you want to just leave it just being adaptable to what to people's needs and not shutting things down and yeah just being open can i can i ask a question about boundaries <clears throat> sure because i think like you said so often people develop these really close relationships with their barber mm -hmm. that i can see it in your barber shop where you got certain barbers who obviously also spend time with the clients outside. Maybe they're having a few drinks and yeah. night out or they're having a big bender on a weekend. Do you guys ever have conversations around like setting boundaries with clients? Is there like, do you try and recommend policies? It's like, okay, you know, don't, don't speak to them too much or, you know, got to have cutoff times or do you, is that something your barbers struggle with? I think a lot of coaches will find with like their clients that they struggle to disconnect because when you create a relationship with someone, you know, especially like someone, someone like a personal training client, that there is this expectation that you're on hand for them at right. all points and that you've kind of, you know, you become friends in a way. Yeah. And a lot of people in the service industry struggle with that. Is that something that you guys have ever had to address or have conversations about? To be honest, no. I think, um, no, it's never even been a thought, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I think everyone's been in the industry before so it's a kind of professionalism that they just have in them that they know that they can be open to people and speak and blah blah, blah. and if their mate comes in they are obviously they're, they're giving their mate a service but it's such a tight um kind of service industry where they've got blocks like 10 hour blocks basically through the day so if you're fully booked you don't actually have time and if you're constantly speaking and you could overrun one client and say you go outside and have a cigarette and then blah 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 with your friend if you eat 15 minutes into your next appointment, that's going to just be a snowball effect for the rest of your day. Mm. And instead of finishing at eight o'clock, you might end up finishing at nine, which one you might not want, but also two, your clients are going to be like, well, you're, how are you 15 minutes late? I needed yeah. to be. So. so I think everyone just understands that a client, it's a, it's, it is a service industry. So timing is key. You can, as long as you're doing your service and getting someone in and out the door at that expected time, give or take, a couple of minutes here and there it's fine at the end of the day it's a barbershop so people might be late and that's where it comes in it's like hold on relax everyone's chill no one's forcing anything and if you are late it happens it's just fine but yeah i think as long as everyone's doing the service to the to the time i think there's there's no issues and we've not had an issue and i've not had to even discuss it with anyone because i think everyone understands that okay so from from getting your hair cut in barbershops yeah many 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 years yep. to now owning a barbershop what are some of the biggest surprises that you have had to deal with as a business owner that you didn't maybe forecast um it's just dealing with people really staff being one but just also like daily questions from customers complaints not complaints just some people just think because they are a client they kind of can do what they want <laughs> care to are we talking about Andy Bratz here? yeah Andy Bratz just walks, <laughs> strolls in whenever he wants no but it's just I think it's the same in any 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 industry as well it's like you get the, the certain clients that because they've come numerous times they can be late 15 minutes or they can just call up five minutes before and expect a free slot on a Friday night that's me yeah <laughs> actually you did do that that is me you did that when was that on Saturday I do every time any, guess, any 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 availability in five minutes no absolutely not it's <laughs> nah, a it saturday wasn't five minutes. It, was, it, it was was like within two hours i'm normally a couple of days in advance so the guys have just, let's put into perspective fridays and saturdays are like the busiest day everyone's fully booked yeah. for from 10 till 8 every day uh, for the, the entire day ed haynes messages on a friday morning hey can you just slot me in at around one o'clock no no i can't any anyone no 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 they're all busy next week maybe I accommodated. You did. To be fair, this is probably why I've had every yes. every barber in your barber shop yeah. has cut my hair, because I, I it's totally my own fault. If I'd have just been a little bit more prepared ahead of time, booked in, I would always get the same barber yeah. because it's always last minute. Yeah. You just shove me on someone else. And to be fair, I've never had a bad haircut at all, so I'm happy. Yeah, so it's there. just little things like that, to be honest. Um, 
and then I think it's the the things that are, I mean that have not surprised me. It's more it's not about a barbershop. It's just it's just the learnings of of any business and just the things that you may have not had to think about before, and then you have to suddenly think about and yeah i think it's just the growing and learning how to manage a business really it's yeah. been more of it and then yeah something like clients sometimes are a bit annoying but <laughs> um if you had a chance to open your business again from scratch so from day one is there one thing that you'd change is covid involved no um just be a little bit more just a tiny bit more planning in terms of budgeting and just it's processes almost that's mm. the one thing that i've been working on now is how uh, the processes of basically how to through trial and error of course so now you're really working out what's what's good and what's bad but it's like how basically the day to day is running how what makes it work mm. and how it ticks how to train the newcomers what you expect of them basically just cl set clear goals for absolutely everything yeah because as soon as everything's transparent yeah but then i think you need to learn and grow on the, as things go on because you yeah. don't know what's going to happen from day one. But I think now, say if you were to open a new gym, you can predict certain things and you'd have a process in place for that. Yeah. But again, there's still going to be things that you have to adapt to. Yeah. It's also once you start understanding the power of processes and yeah, what we're really course, saying yeah. here is that be as black and white yeah, on yeah. everything yeah, as possible. Yeah. Like don't make any assumptions. I remember we had yeah. a conversation in your early days of um, opening source where you were like, I can't believe someone wouldn't put a toilet roll back on the toilet <laughs> yeah, roll holder. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, we, I you know, I read your sign there. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, we deal with the same thing all the time, but until we had a meeting and put a sign yeah. up to say when the toilet roll yeah, yeah, yeah. holder is empty, put a new one on there until you have that system yeah, there, yeah. then no one's going to do it. Yeah, I some, mean, pe some people might always do it. Yeah, You're yeah. going to do it. I'm probably going to yeah. do it. But you know, making that assumption and it's like, okay, the way that I look at business all the time, especially within here at Coastal and actually even with the process, it's like, okay, where is there an opportunity to build a new process? Yeah. Okay. If someone is continually making it or you're seeing the same mistake happen over and over again, yeah. you ask yourself straight away, is there a clear process here or is there something that needs to improve? And mm. nine times out of 10, it's because the process isn't there and it's not clear or it hasn't been communicated effectively. Yeah. So I kind of love actually just, okay, create a process here, create a system here. Yeah. So it's just those, and and just yeah, just being transparent and clear with everything. I think that just helps a lot. Yeah, um, because totally I think agree. I mean, it, sometimes it, you can feel like a bit of a like a stickler for rules and stuff. But then also, some people really like to, the clarity, and I think that's what you've learned is just making. Some people just love to be told, "Here you go. Here's your five bullet points that you need to know." I would say that most people want that. Yeah, but I think we 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 get we get this idea that people want like freedom. Yeah. Um. But at the end of the day, if giving someone freedom means that you need to constantly tell them reprimand them yeah, or yeah. tell them to improve, like no no one wants that. No, no. You like you don't want to give it to them. They yeah. don't want to receive it. So having systems and clarity yeah. in place just yeah. makes life so but much easier. To be honest, I mean, barber. I've, I often say it's like it's a, we're not reinventing the wheel in the barbershop. Mm. Like it's a it's something that's been going for years. So I mean, in terms of processes, it's not like it's just getting basically to start like everyone on the same page and understanding things and just expect getting everyone to understand how we would expect source to work and how the clients we expect the clients to be and blah 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 so it's just little things like that but it's, yeah just putting it down and getting it all clear for everyone i think question for you this is from mr chris twazon mm -hmm. um who hi, is chris. hi chris um he he i feel like he rates himself as someone who has a good haircut right um what kind of haircut has he, got? he has he's kind of like a fade uh, and then he's like an up and back on the top. Actually, trying to think about it now, it's not that consistent. It's not that clear. Right. He recently had a very aggressive fade done. Okay. He likes a long flop over on the front. Right. Anyway, he asks a question which says, his question is, Jack, pick a side and tell me why. Line up or natural hairline? Can I just clarify what he means? As a boring person doesn't know much about cool shit. <laughs> is, what he, is, is he asking here like, for example, the back of my hair where the hairline yeah finishes they sometimes seem to shape that and put a straight line through yeah. or an angle or just let it go where it wants is that what he's asking so i think it could be two different ways so a lineup would normally be say if you've got like a buzz cut and you so what's a buzz cut shaved shaved, shaved head. head a shaved head right. yeah 
um and then you'd almost like create like a real sharp like box around mm. the front on your fringe and then like down and just like make the outline of your hair like super clear yeah so i think that's what i would understand as a yeah lineup. that makes sense but then keeping it natural again if i'm thinking about a buzz cut is a where it's just like they're not chop. They're not shaving into it like with a real mm. detailed razor. Would you say you know when we, when I used to have the side parting and the shaved size, where we, they put a line in my hair? Is yeah. that was that kind of like it or not really? That's no. just something else. But so I think what we could oh, say really is what you. So I think you could talk about around the back or like maybe on your sideburns. Mm. So you see some people that just like leave them and there's like a straight line, mm. uh, like uh, like around the back of your head, or you can like taper it out and fade it so it's a bit more like it looks a lot more natural. So I would say a taper where it looks more natural as opposed to like just a, a square line at the back of my So head. you like, you prefer natural? But then that's what I'm saying. If he means a natural, if I, so if I'm going to say, if, it, if, if it's in terms of a buzz cut, I would have a line up because I think it looks really sharp. Mm. But if it was in terms of what I'm thinking it might be, which is like around the back and like on your sideburns where you can either like leave longish hair and just like a square line and it just looks like really blunt and not finished. Mm. I'd rather it be like blended out so you haven't you just sat in the middle no you haven't taken a side yeah because this so i mean i've just had mine today right and you can see that that's kind of like a natural natural fade up there isn't it mm, that's nice as opposed to just imagine if that was all just one one length and then just chopped True. off at the back so I'm, I'm looking at your neck and you're quite a hairy man all right don't and i feel like your neck hasn't been very well looked after there's no, so hair was, everywhere so if luckily we're on a podcast yeah, <laughs> otherwise on youtube but we're not. It's all about the voice. <laughs> okay. So um, okay. So, I so, what, so can you can you tell me where are we? Are we line up? Or are we natural hairline? Okay. So we are we going with buzz cut? Yeah. Sure. Okay. If it was a buzz cut, I'd like a a, a line up. Nice. There you but go. I, Chris. If I had a good hairline. Okay. This question was also asked by Mr. Chris Twaz, and I'm not sure if I want to ask it because I have a feeling that it's not going to be a nice answer, but maybe it will be a nice answer. I'll be surprised. The question is, um, how would you rate my current hairstyle? Ten out of ten. <laughs> okay 10 out of 10 thank you well obviously i had this done at source yes um and by toby who just cut my hair as well yeah toby she's she's awesome mm -hmm. um can you tell me why you love my hair because and i'm not just talking about my haircut i'm talking about the whole package like the hair with my head and everything uh, no just the hair is fine okay because you're looking a bit weathered these days too much sun too many not 20 enough, minutes actually. we have 20 we ha minutes we haven't had much 20 should minutes be 19 recently. minutes a day because 20 <laughs> we haven't had much. any I haven't posted 20 mad in over a week because we had the sun literally that showed this morning? it. Yeah, that was on my little commute. I had like a minute in the sun. Right. No, uh, no, it's good. And it suits your, you look like Josh Hartnett. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Josh, for 20 years of inspiration. Um, okay. We've been talking a lot about what makes Source unique, what mm -hmm. you have done um, to you know help move you guys towards success we also haven't defined what that is yet because you did say you feel like you're not successful yet yeah um but people can get their haircut anywhere yep at the end of the day what makes you different to every other barbers um i think it is the like you said the community aspect mm. and i think people come now one because they know they're actually that like the haircuts are really good and you can trust what our guys are going to do they can deal with everything um, they were super creative as well. So you get a lot of people coming in looking for some, some styles that is not, the, not the norm for a barbershop. Do you know what I mean? Not just like a, a fade, blah, blah, blah. But I think it is the community aspect, but I also, I think it is the staff, honestly, like, yeah. like I'm saying, Sean is so, so open and personable that where he can get clients just because he, he'll talk to them, give them an amazing haircut, but he, people just feel so at home and welcome. And I think that goes across the board to everyone where whoever you see, they're going to be open and have the, their own conversations with you and make you feel a certain way where you're at ease knowing that you're going to get a really good haircut, but you're also just in a safe space and like a comfortable space where, yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, I think it's, I think it's that. I'd agree. I'd agree. I think that's what makes, that's something I've never experienced in any other barber shop um in all the years i've had yeah. my hair cut and I think, that's why i can yeah. come back i think we just yeah like I said, we just want it to be a super chilled place like we're not forcing anything i think that's one thing that we i think does come across is that we're trying to be chilled but we're not forcing it so it is completely organic that's just how i am that's how sean is that's how our staff are mm. they're not having to fake coolness not be not coolness but just welcomeness yeah but you know what i mean i feel <laughs> like a lot of 
barbershops do that it's mm. like there's this crit this perception that a barbershop has to be cool yeah the exterior and the logo yeah, yeah, yeah. looks cool like you know the guys have all like got perfectly crafted yeah. like thin mustaches mm. and you walk in it's almost a bit too Stale. cool where yeah. someone like me who's maybe not that cool walks in and i'm like I yeah feel that yeah bit. no i think we've just tried to make it just a I mean, yeah, just just a normal place. Okay, so I want to go back to that, that question then, because at the start of this podcast, you know, I had said that you know what what has what have you put in to make this a successful organization? And you started by saying, "I don't feel like we're successful yet." So, what is success to you? Um, so, I think when will you be successful? It's a good question. I don't know what you. I don't know how you'd manage. Well, put a, a pin on success. I yeah. think one is finances. If you're, is there is there a point where enough is enough though? Like, do you think there's going to get you're going to get to that point? I mean, I don't think it would be enough is enough because I think as long as it's a, as long as it's sustainable, but making enough money, and you can op potentially open places, maybe another one in in Hong Kong or elsewhere, maybe one in in Europe somewhere, and have a couple around the world. I think that's where I would be like, right, we're and everything's just ticking over itself and there is money being generated mm. i think that is where i'd say we're successful it doesn't have to we don't have to say we're we're making billions but as long as everything's sustainable and there is obviously profit to be had and everyone's working and the, the, the brand itself is going well then i think that's when i would say we're successful yeah i always find that a very hard question to answer when would you say you're successful I feel like it's always changing. I feel like that my answer to that question is always changing. But I think it's, it's what you set your own goal as yeah. success. I would say right now, <clears throat> like at where, I, where I'm at in my own life, you know, for me being the business owner of, of the company is that success for me at this point in time will be, okay, if I, I I'm going to think about my team, actually. I think about my team a lot these days and I want to create, I want to be able to give them a life professionally, personally, and financially that allows them to achieve all their dreams. And that is something that I feel like I, I'm not doing right now because, you know, we're still a growing company. But, but, how, I know can, but how, how can you give that to people? I think I, I mean, I can't give it all to them yeah. for sure, but I have, I can have a part to play. And that. I think the financial part is what I would love. I basically, the easy way to say is that I'd love to be able to pay all my, all my team more money. Yeah. Um, and I know none of them, none of them are necessarily financially driven, but I know that a little bit more would help them, yeah. you know, just be at more comfort and, and I think live a bit more of a fulfilled life. So that's one. Um, I think as well for myself, you know, profitability, I've never been driven by money and money has never dictated whether I think this company is successful or not. Um, but I probably, you know, at age 35 now, I'm at a point where, you know, I've just got engaged you know, would love to start a family in the next few years mm. in the not too long distant future. And, you know, I would love to have, you know, finances that allows me to yeah. still do what I love, but also, you know, go on a holiday, know that I've got enough for school fees in the future. Mm. And so that has now meant at this point in my life, the financial side of my business is a little bit more important where it never really was for the last 16 years. It was always just enough to just yeah. live yeah. in a in a comfortable apartment, have a few holidays a year yeah. and not be losing money. So that's definitely changed. Um, the idea, impact is always something I think about, right? It's like how many lives are we truly impacting? Uh, and truly impacting isn't just like giving a program, but like creating a connection with them and like, you know, seeing wholesale change happen to that person and then knowing that they're going to have a ripple effect to their people. So that's always going to be at the center of what I think is successful. It's success to me. Though, it's hard, it's very yeah. It's hard to do, um, and I think yeah. Just fuck. I can actually go on for ages. No one's asked me this question in a really long time. But I think mean, I think just having me, everyone in this organization, and this company acting in an authentic way that is true to who we actually are. Right. That is something that I'm always thinking about. And do I hope. You, and do hope, you not feel like that's now? Yeah, but yeah. I think I think I have that. But I think, feel like we're not like the financial side yeah. perhaps is not actually where I want it to be. So it's kind of like, there's always lots of things that are maybe ticking the box of success, yeah. but then there are other things that aren't quite there yet. And I feel like that's maybe always going to be there. So it's like, are, am I ever going to feel that it's truly mm. successful and I feel successful? I don't know. I don't know if I, 
I can say that in 15 years, I've never felt that we're truly successful. Like there's been periods where, you know, you're hitting momentum and, you know, something's going really well. You know, you just, you get some really great brand exposure. You have loads of new customers come in, you hire some great coaches. You're like, oh, that's amazing. But then there's always something that is not where you want it to be. Yeah, but surely you having been for going for 15 years and got through COVID, surely you could say that that's a successful business. Yeah, see, that's that's interesting because, you know, that's your outlook on looking at my business. And yeah, I think but you, because that's you taking that's taking finance out of it. That's yeah. just having a sustainable business, basically. Yeah. And I think don't get me wrong. I think there's there's a lot of that that I'm proud about. I'm very proud of, but I'm not satisfied. So I guess the answer is like always content, but never satisfied. That's that's just how I feel about so the idea of success. Finances, finance, money rules. Money is doesn't rule but it's important yeah it plays a part you know i guess it and i always want i guess my nature is that I'll, i always want to see improvement mm. and like things moving forward whether it's myself personally or it's the business i want to, i don't want stagnation right i want yeah. growth and you know there's only so much growth that you can do without finances being a contributor yeah. at some points in time you know you need injections of capitals you need to reinvest and yeah i guess here's yeah. a question for you hit me when is Source 2.0, uh, uh, Coastal 2.0 happening? That's a great question. No plans, no immediate plans for a second Coastal at the moment. I think in the future, I can envision like a process programming headquarters somewhere. And I don't know if it'll be in Hong Kong. It will be like, in, in my head, it's like somewhere hot, tropical. There's lots of Green trees. Bali. <laughs> no, nah, I don't think Bali. Thailand. Maybe Thailand. I could see Thailand more than France. Bali. Oh, parts of Europe would be cool. But I don't speak the language though. So not yet anyway. Well, it's on the board. Monthly yeah. goal. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing that. <laughs> That's just finished level one, by the way. There's like uh, okay. five levels. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I do envision like a headquarters somewhere. And then we've got like this huge... I, I always envision this like massive hangar. And it's like a huge training space. We've got like a, a lap pool. We've got an AstroTurf pitch. Right. We've got like outdoor, an outdoor training facility. Um, we've got a home base of people who are training there all the time. You know, we're serving the local community, but it's also a headquarters where people can fly in, spend a week there, you know, train. Yeah. And, and there's, there's physiotherapists. There's like, you can get your bloods done. There's yeah. chiropractors, there's doctors. Like it's a all encompassing wellness facility. That's the dream. That's the thing I manifest all the time, but Kinta Delago, Ali Reese. <laughs> Shout out. Yeah, come on, Reese. <laughs> Help us out, mate. That's what mates do. Um, Jack, last question for yeah. you. Uh, we have a tradition on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know about it. And we ask our guest uh, to describe their perfect day. Is this a working day or just a general day? If you think that work is a part of your perfect day, then by all means include it. So I think that a perfect day for me is when I've just had many perfect days when I've been on holiday. Mm. I like being by the ocean um, in a nice, like sunny area. So for me, south of Italy, along the coast, just hanging out by the sea, eating good food with my fiance, Polly, mm. and just really not doing much. Nice. Are you, is there exercise? No. <laughs> no. Are you in a barber shop at any point in time? No. Are you maybe, working? Maybe getting a haircut. No. 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 Nice. No, just really just, just, just feet yeah. up. Yeah. Enjoying it. <clears throat> I do. Uh, yeah. I like being in the sun. I do like a chill. Love it. Um, and when I am chilling, I don't exercise. Yeah. Been on many, many a holiday together where you have not partaken <laughs> in 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 any of the lads exercise no. sessions at any point in time shouldn't have to yeah I mean, the holiday the, is and for at holiday. the end, end of the holiday you look just as good as when you started it. exactly so holidays for holiday your body needs to rest rest <laughs> is just as important so they say and that is a deload month <laughs> nice. or a week or two weeks <laughs> love it it's taco it. um Sorry, that's your nickname that yeah. no one else that listens to this podcast would know. So, Jack, yeah. thank you so much Thanks. for joining me finally on this podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for sharing everything to do with Source and your journey. Uh, I look forward to having you back on where we talk about your football career, which I think is going to be an interesting conversation. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to it.